Hello there. Welcome, welcome, boys and girls. Everyone, come on in to this Blueprint and Med School Tutors Hanging Out with Cram Fighters webinar. Today, we are going to do visual diagnosis for step one, level one. My name is Dave Del Negro. With me is uh, Camden McDowell, Dr. McDowell. Tell us about yourself. Yeah. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm a tutor here with Blueprint. Um, I specialize in uh, step one tutoring. I'm excited to, you know, uh, talk with you um, all today and, and go through some of these questions um, and really try to give you some hints about how we can take what they give us with these images and use it to get these questions right. Yeah. So um, again, my name is Dave. I'm a uh, senior uh, emergency medicine resident was going to be an attending in 70 days. Oh, man. Not How many I'm hours? <laughs> I, have, I have it on my phone. I'll look at it at some point. Um, so, yeah, we'd like to welcome everyone. I know there's people sort of like uh, trickling in. Um, thank you all for joining us. If you have questions, we have a chat. At the very end, we will have a one-on-one -on -one chat. Um, and we can put all your questions if we don't get to them during the, the session. Um, but a little bit about sort of us, uh, Blueprint Medical, we go from you know, pre-med now to med school, to residency and beyond. Uh, we've partnered with Cram Fighter, Ross Review. So if there's something to do with medical education, I bet you we do it through, through some way or another. Um, and we'll talk more about that later before we do the Q&A. What we're going to cover today, general approach for images and USMLE style questions. Now, uh, images are in about one third of USMLE questions. And they're, you know, so they're fairly common. And the amount that your questions will need you to rely on the images varies. There are some questions that have a sentence or two, and then just a picture of a random kidney. I remember that was on my step one. And there was no other hints. It was just you either got this path question right or you did not. Um, and some have lots of vignettes that the, the, the image can point you towards. So we're going to talk about how to approach questions and images in, in a systematic way, because there's only a finite amount of things they can ask you on step one, level one about them. Uh, we're going to talk about med school tutors, and we're going to answer some questions. So some general tips. Um, step one, um, for all those who love histology, gross pathology, uh, please stand up. Bless your soul. <laughs> Was not me. Um, thankfully for the rest of us, uh, most of it falls away except for largely hemoc. Um, but I mean, here's x-rays to read. There's um, chest x-rays. There's all sorts of things to know. There's heart sounds and whatnot. And it's not just hard for for one person, it's hard for everyone because a lot of the times the the images, um, you know, especially especially if it's not on the real exam, they may be the potato quality images or blurry or something like that. Um, so generally, what I tell people to do when they approach a um, uh, a question with images is either to do one of two things. It's the same way I tell people how to read X-rays either do a systematic approach where you don't look at the thing that's right in front of you or do the exact opposite. Look at the giant thing and then go back to your systematic approach, whatever sort of works um, for you. That depends, we'll talk about x-rays, we'll talk about path findings. Um, Cam, is there anything in particular you do um, when you're reviewing images in a practice question? No, I think I, I, I do exactly uh, what you mentioned is sometimes when you get to it and they don't offer you a lot in the vignette, yeah. you don't have much of a diagnosis going into it and you just get some picture. That's a great opportunity for a lot of students where you kind of do that systemic approach, kind of systematic approach, because you're trying to build up the clues, figure out what you're trying to look for. Mm -hmm. But then other times they give you a vignette and you're like, well, this is one of two things. The picture is going to tell me what it is. And then that's where you kind of can you know, a lot of the times jump to what they're showing you, which is going to be the center of the picture nine times out of 10 mm -hmm. and use that to, uh, you know, choose between your, your two answer choices that you've already narrowed down, but we'll practice some examples of that as we go through. Yeah. And that's, and it's a good way to think about it too. It's largely the, the radiology and pathology that you see on these questions are going to be fairly classic as opposed to what they will be in real life. And they have to be straightforward too. If it's sarcoidosis, there better be hyaluronic lymphadenopathy. 
<laughs> if not, they're not going to give you a picture of an x-ray. This is not going to happen. So um, they all have to follow pretty standard board uh, guideline question records. So if you don't see something there, take a step back, think what, you know, what sort of conditions have I been taught to read on this particular x-ray or read with this particular pathology sign? Because as it says at the bottom, they don't expect you to be a radiologist. They expect you to be able to read very simple um, radiology pictures and paths. So we'll, we'll start off, um, um, Camden, take a look at this. Ah, That's all of radiology. A... Just check this out. <laughs> mm -hmm. So one thing when we're going through all these questions today, everyone, you know, it, this is best to be done as, as active learning. I want you guys engaged. I want you interacting on the chat. Uh, yeah. I'll be asking questions um, and, you know, while you may not see what everyone else is writing, we see it and we'll kind of talk back uh, with you. Let's make this interactive. Let's make it fun. So the very first thing when you see this picture is let's orient ourselves, you know, very simply, you know, mm -hmm. we're looking at the lower extremities. Okay. Uh, and, <laughs> and we can start off there and say, okay, well, we've got to, um, you know, to shins, uh, and what immediately stands out to us. There's a very obvious finding that stands out to us. We already wow. have some good answers starting to come in through the, um, through, the, through the prompt. Perfect. And so yeah. what I want to ask is two things. One, what, how would you describe the image that we're seeing? Does this, you know, look painful? Does it look erythematous? Uh, and then what is your differential? What is the diagnosis and what is the differential uh, that you're thinking about? And I see and so a, I, couple of, a couple of you have gotten it right now. Now that you've got it right in the chat, what do you think this could be? Exactly. So we have a lot of people coming out with erythema nodosum. Awesome. You're totally right. Erythema nodosum. When I think about these lesions, I'm seeing uh, uh, what look, you know, they're painful. They're raised. They're red. Um, and... Yeah, this is, you know, these are kind of the, the, the high hitting points, but the big thing here is that um, we know their location, we know their bilateral, that tells us something about our differential. We're looking for something that's a little bit more systemic. And in particular with the er er erythema nodosum, we're looking for something that's a bit more inflammatory. So if you look at all of our high yield associations, we have sarcoidosis, we have TB, we have IBD, we've got um, uh, some um, of our uh, coccidiomycosis, uh, I can never say that. And uh, all of these things have to either do with inflammatory or infectious, that then leads to kind of inflammatory reactions. Mm -hmm. And so the key thing here is it's bilateral, it's located on the shins, it's red, it's painful, that's kind of the big picture items you take home from the uh, picture that then get us to these high yield associations. Now, mm -hmm. let's dig a little bit deeper. What is the actual mechanism? Like what's actually going on here when you see these red uh, inflammatory lesions? What do they reflect? Seeing some bruising, maybe anema. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Uh, this it makes, one... me think, makes me think of something that's on the differential that would mm -hmm. be like uh, purpura. Mm -hmm. uh, this could be this could appear purpuric, but it, it's not pain. Purpura tends to be less painful. Yeah, and we had someone who just hit the nail on the head. Nice. Mustafa, inf inflammation of subcutaneous Felix fat. as exactly. well. Nice. That's what's going on. Beautiful. Anything else but, to add on that? No, I think the next picture. Yeah, I think so. I usually see coccidiomycosis most commonly out of all of these on step one. Yep. They really like it. And for extra points, where's, uh, where's coccidiomycosis hanging out? Southwest, exactly. So awesome. Southwest USA, even more accurate. So you think Arizona, New Mexico, all the places where Breaking Bad film. Uh, <laughs> image number two. So, so what, we have a CAT scan here. And CAT scan, I remember being in the preclinical years and being frustrated because first off, CAT scans are impossible to read. Even to this day, I, I, I like rudimentary, oh, the saddest liver. Very, very correct. So, um, um, and um, what's it called? You know, they, they just drop you in the middle of a slice and in, in the middle of like this huge um, visual uh, image. So it's again, orient yourself like Cameron said is so important. So. You can't miss that it is a liver, 
But like again, what I what I what I tell what I tell people when they read, get the big thing out of the way. Wow, that big thing is the liver with spots on. Not great. Uh, but don't forget to look around. It's, okay, I see the spleen on patient left. I see the vertebrae. I see the descending aorta. So, and that's why I love to tell people, don't, don't so many people try and teach uh, radiology, ignore the big thing. Just look at the big thing first, but then go back to your systemic approach. I see the big liver with spots. And now I see the spleen, that appears okay. I see the vertebrae, that appears okay. I see the descending, um, what's it called? I see a couple thoughts of what this could be. Now, hepatocellular carcinoma is, is on the differentials, also cirrhosis. The, the spotty appearance of this is a little bit different than what you would expect from cirrhosis or HCC. Um, there's sort of a hint. Why is it so spotty? And I can, I, mean, I can tell you, I've seen this exact CAT scan. It's, it's always a sad case. It's always grandma who is the nicest human alive. And she's like 80 and she never, well done the cell. She never got a colonoscopy. I think I saw this two or three times in med school. Um, didn't get a colonoscopy. She didn't think she needed one. She didn't think that women needed colonoscopies. Um, and just, you know, had some weight loss and some sweats and all of a sudden woke up with stage four metastasis to the liver from the colon. It's a very sad disease, but if they've, and, and not only in the liver, you will see the spotty pattern in the brain on um, step one as well. That's the other place you're gonna, because they have to give you an organ slice big enough to, for you to pick up the spots, um, the lungs as well. Lungs, brain, liver, you're gonna see spotty patterns and it's usually metastasis. And there it is, it's in the colon. Um, what's it called, colon, stomach, pancreas, breast, lung. These are the places that tend to metastasize the liver. Oh, Camden, you took step one earlier, more recently than I do. I'm trying to remember the seed and soil theory of neoplasm and all that fun stuff. Yeah. Uh, I think the more, the big one for step one, uh, you know, there's, there's that whole kind of way of thinking about it, but in general, knowing these associations, knowing the kind of like one, two, three for where you would expect, first of all, where it's the most likely, then where it's the second most likely, a third most likely, you know, origin of the original cancer is really good to know, you know, nine times out of 10, it's going to be something either in the gut or the lungs, but, yeah. you know, having a little bit more specificity, you know, thinking, yeah, you know, this will be, you know, pancreatic or something like that is a really good way to start when you um, are first learning these associations. And this is sort of what, like what a normal liver should look like. Mm -hmm. um, you should be able to see sort of the hepatic lobules. Um, it looks like a little slice of gallbladder hanging out in there. Um, and again, just do it systemically. So in this place, it would be clock, counterclockwise for me because I'd start with the big honking liver here. Okay, then you got your vertebrae, you got your spleen. What's this thing in the middle here with all the contrast? I'm gonna make, we're gonna convert everyone into radiologists. What's this? <laughs> What's this? Uh, anyone wanna take a stab at it? Yeah, it's just the stomach. Well done, exactly. Mustafa. So, or, or the duodenum, depending where it is, truth be told. Probably stomach based off the size of it, um, but uh, definitely stomach duodenum area. And then it looks like you have your uh, descending aorta giving rise to something that I knew at one time. Um, image three, Camden, what in the wide world of sports is this? Well. Kind of, this actually builds, even though it's not a CT, you know, it's not, uh, we're not doing radiology here, but it builds off of what we we're just talking about in that last slide, which is let's learn a little bit about what something looks like when it's normal. So I encourage you, all of these, think of what normal looks like and abnormal. Here we're dealing, again, I like to start it simple. We're dealing with a tube. Okay. Where do we look at tubes in the body when we have something, uh, you know, that we're taking the pictures of internally at both ends. And so, you know, one, we're going to be looking at something, you know, more in the, um, you know, uh, upper uh, digestive system, you know, for example, our esophagus, or we're going to be looking at something down, you know, in the colon. So here, I already see people saying in the chat, we're looking at a picture of an esophagus. And does this esophagus look healthy? Does it look normal? Mm -hmm. No, no, not at all. 
This is, and I already see a lot of folks answering great answers. This is Baird's esophagus. High yield, high yield. It's great for step one. But to get that from the picture is to know where you are. So this is where you have to know what a normal esophagus looks like. Imagine where you are and then say, what is wrong here? What I'm looking at is I look like I have reasonably healthy tissue, but then I have you know, almost kind of ulcerated or, or, or um, eroded, I think is the term I like to use, sort of this eroded um, uh, kind of metapla metaplasia of, of tissue that's occurring uh, in the lower areas of our esophagus. And what is the etiology of that? What's actually going on in Barrett's esophagus? Uh, yeah. Yeah, acid. Yeah, we're getting a lot of acids. What erodes things <laughs> in general? Again, I like to keep it basic. What is a great, you know, at, at eroding the inner lining of our GI tract? Acids and bases in some cases, but a lot of the time it's stomach acid that gets in places where it shouldn't be. That is the essence of Barrett's esophagus, and that's what we're seeing here. Beautiful. And to summarize it even more, I love this, you know, of course, there's the actual, you know, specifics of the histology, but even more, you know, knowing, just like we talked about in the last slide, that what is the most likely thing that this patient is at risk of developing? That is a you world question right there. They show you this picture, they ask that. Well, it's esophageal adenocarcinoma. Beautiful. Anything to add on that? No, I mean, I, I think that's really well done. So, and, and, and you know, the metaplasia is the big part here. This is, uh, this is previously um, stratified epithelium that is used to, and again, when it comes to histology, um, think about why stuff's there. It's non-keratinized stratified squamous because there's food clunking on it all day long. It just needs to be tough because the, the stuff you eat is just clunking down the esophagus. It becomes columnar epithelium with goblet cells because of the acid. So it's, you know, the histology meets the function or the needs of the area is, is sort of the only note I would put on that. Um, time to go to heme onc land. Um, we got a quick question. What's the difference between metaplasia and dysplasia? Metaplasia, so usually it goes in order of metaplasia then dysplasia. Mm -hmm. um, if and you don't need metaplasia to do dysplasia. Now, metaplasia means the changing of the style of the, of the epithelium, um, usually in response to, as we saw here, a different stimuli dysplasia is the pre-neoplastic or pre-cancerous process. They're related, but they're not entirely the same. And I see everyone has, got, has, has answered this one already. Uh, this is indeed Rouleau formation. Um, and yeah, agglutination, exactly. Um, everyone's got this one. Multiple myeloma, Rouleau formation, um, what's it called? The electrostatic charges are altered and they sort of clump together. So don't need to say anything more else than that. Um, multiple myeloma, how do you diagnose it? There'll, that'll be our bonus question. Immunoglobulins, yeah, particularly the SPEP, UPEP. You're going to have a large spike because um, you're, you're a member. Um, it's a monoclonal expansion because it is a, uh, it's, not, it's a cancer. So you're going to get this big unnatural spike of the cancer um, that is going to show up. Uh, well done. This, uh, this crew is on this. Right? this crew's, yeah, they're, they're doing yeah, great. Yeah, they're zooming. Um, and again, comparison to the normal. So and on the have... Yep, sorry. Right. Well, I was saying on this comparison to the normal, um, and this is again one of those great opportunities to think of, okay, not only is what's wrong in this specific you know, slide that I'm looking at, where I have these red blood cells stacked like poker chips, I have the Rouleau formation, all of that. What else could I see? How else could they test me with a similar style image? Maybe the one that shows schistocytes, you know, one that shows uh, um, kind of, uh, you know, uh, reticulocytes, uh, anything that looks abnormal. And so again, getting comfortable with the normal images is going to help you figure out what's going wrong when they show you something that's out of place. No, that's beautiful because you took a look at this normal one, like 
There is a couple spherocytes here, which means you better know what spherocytosis and hereditary spherocytosis looks like. There's a couple with hypochromic hypoplasia. And like, you know, here's another bonus question. Um, what is classically a microcytic hypochromic red blood cell pathognomonic for? I gotta, we gotta give them harder questions. They're getting all our easy ones. I know. <laughs> nice, the sauna is not fooled. Um, iron deficiency in particular uh, style of anemia. The hypochromia is fairly pathognomonic, particularly on the boards um, with an MCV of, no fair, <laughs> all good, all good. Uh, we'll, all, we'll all get there. Uh, yep, yeah, MCV less than 80 classically, especially if it is a chronic um, iron deficiency anemia. In the very beginning, it might be higher 80s, but um, they try and make it straightforward. Speaking of path, Camden, speaking of things that are clumped together, Definitely. Uh, so what are we, here? yeah, what are we seeing in this image? Everyone? <laughs> wow. People really jumped on that one fast too as well, but yeah, no, oh, we're God. seeing, we're seeing a lot of things and here's actually a great image. When you first look at this image, yeah, you know, there's a lot going on here, but one thing I like about this is this is a great example of how what you care about nine times out of 10 is going to be in the middle mm. of that image. And so when you're like, I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to be looking for, go to the middle of the image and look for something that looks different. Mm -hmm. And let's see if I can zoom in here a little bit, but what do we start seeing? What do we start seeing in here? I'm like seeing owl something rods. called our rods. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And what are those, what are those made up of actually? Uh, here's our bonus question for that. What are our rods made up of? Super and spice and everything nice. And before we bef and don't click through quite yet, because I also want to have us talk through, ah. you know, what are we thinking is actually going on here? Mm -hmm. So we've got our R rods and immediately in your head, something should kind of start to pop up as you, you know, as you work your way through studying anyone who, you know, nothing pops up quite yet. Don't don't feel intimidated. It shouldn't yet. Once we get farther along in our studies, we might have, you know, some thoughts popping up and that's going to be I'm seeing a lot of it. Yeah, AML and APL. We're looking at leukemias here. We're looking at leukemias. And one of the ways that they love to test this on step one is they're not going to get give you a picture of this and say, does this person, like, what does this person have? What is the diagnosis? That's, they might, but more likely what they're going to ask is, here's this image. We see these owl rods. We know internally that it probably is APL or a a AML. What is the chromosomal translocation associated That's with this condition? The donkey card. As an Aki card, it's a year old question. <laughs> My, I, I swear, I think they I think they pregame this lecture. I think so. Mm -hmm. But exactly, I'm seeing a lot of T1517s. So we can go to the next one. Um, and uh, the big one there, I also wanted to point out though, is we treat this with all trans retinoic acid. Give me another name. Ah, perfect. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot perfect. of vitamin A's. That's what we're giving it. Perfect. So just to, just to throw some more uh, spice into this, what is the feared complication if these hour rods degranulate? Mm -hmm. My God, I can't slip anything past them. I'm going to start asking you all step two questions. Uh, it is indeed DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulopathy. Um, aha! Good luck figuring this one out so easy. Now, what happening here. So um, x-rays, checks x-ray, there's so many ways to do it. There's like the classical A, B, C, D, E. There's a gazillion ways to read a chest x-ray. So classically, I'd say, oh, look, here's the airway. Uh, let me see if I can change this to make this. Uh, where is, there's my spotlight right there. So here is your airway. There's your carina there. So uh, B stands for breath. So you follow, you see a whole bunch of lungs here. I do see what appears to be very, very plump hilum here. Wonder what that means. Um, C stands for cardiac. I don't see any cardiomegaly. I see a normal aortic knob. I don't see a widened mediastinum. Uh, D stands for uh, diaphragm. I see nice, sharp diaphragmatic or diacostophrenic angles. I don't see free air under and indicating um, 
perforated viscous, and E stands for everything else, and always it's fun to try and play the game. Is there a, ri a, a rib x-ray? Almost impossible to find. Um, what's it called? So yeah, it's this plumpness of the hilum that's very, if it's, this is one of those things that you need to see this picture in, in connection with the question once or twice, because it's subtle if you're not looking for this. Uh, I mean, if you're, if you're in a, in a clinic and you're just not looking for this, it's real subtle. And could, you could just read this off as um, plump hilar uh, vascular, but this is hilar lymphadenopathy because of how rounded this sort of area is. So what do y'all think about hilar lymphadenopathy? Um, what, do you, what is classically associated? I see a couple people uh, got it. Um, it's nonspecific sometimes. I do, I do like that there is a burgeoning differential here. Uh, what if we added that this was a 36-year-old African-American woman who had a calcium of 10.9? Does that narrow? Yeah, that narrows it down very nicely. So, <laughs> yeah. So, and, and that's what you have to do with when you, and, and that's a good example of like, you know, hyalur lymphadenopathy in real life really doesn't tell you a whole lot, but if you put it together with like demographic information um, and lab information and your clinical scenario, it can point you in the right direction. Now, if they're gonna give you something as subtle or as not specific as this, they better give you everything that I just sort of talked about. Uh, but yes, this is hyalur lymphadenopathy, classically associated with car sarcoidosis, which causes immune mediated widespread non-caseating, which I don't know about you, Cam, that was always the most unesthetic word, caseating, because it like, <laughs> literally translates to cheesing. Ugh. Yeah, well, you don't forget it. You don't. <laughs> uh, what, what would it be if it was a caseating granuloma? Uh, let's see. Let's see if we can show. Oh, there we go. TB. Mm -hmm. TB is correct. Uh, TB or fungal, classically, is uh, a little cheesy. Um, elevated serum ACE levels. I've never ordered serum ACE, but it'll be there. Hypercalcemia, all that good stuff. Um, and then sarcoidosis can affect any organ, including the, uh, the brain, uh, the heart. Um, all right, Cameron, I think I got him on this one. What type of cardiomyopathy would, would result from sarcoidosis? Oh, that's a good one. That is a good one. Uh, yeah, well done, Santa. Restrictive cardiomyopathy because of the infiltration and the fibrosis and Basil and Elizabeth. Well done, well done. And Felix, everyone crushing it these days. My goodness. Um, anything to add to this one? No, I think, uh, I think that really sums it up. Beautiful. And this is a, uh, and this is it. And it, Wait until y'all side so this year. It's my final year of residency. And I moonlight nearby at a uh, at an urgent care. And it's never so much fun as when you have to read your own x-rays and there's no radiologist for 24 hours. Uh, and then you start to squint and say, is that really something? I don't know. Maybe I'm just hallucinating. Um, but no, hyla in x-rays can be right? Never knew what normal hyla looked like. It's, they just, they just, it's just vascularity. Um, and in real life, you just, you, you love to have a prior because most people's hyla look the same across different x-rays and across different years. But like you take a look at our normal x-ray, again, use your, uh, use your classical ABCD. Here's your airway with your carina. There's no endotracheal tube here, but if there was, you would evaluate it. B stands for breath, and there's so many different ones. Just pick one that you like, your favorite mnemonic. Here's nice, there's a nice amount of ribs here. It's not rotated, all that good stuff. It's good inspiratory effort. C for heart, this is actually a very nice heart with a with an apex here and a uh, aortic notch. There's no wide amenostinum, no cardiomegaly, diaphragm, normal blunt, excuse me, normal sharp angles, no subdiaphragmatic air. E stands for everything else. You'll never see a rib fracture in this low quality, but every once in a while, they'll try and slip one past you. So, um, excellent.
So image seven, back to back to my world, uh, the life of CAT scans. This is a great one. Um, this is a great image. And, you know, let's get back to the basics again. The very first thing you need to do when you get an image like this is establish, you know, where you're at. Um, and, you know, so we've got the sternum up in the front. We've got a vertebrae back here. We know that we're looking feet up. So you're going to reverse the sides uh, so that, you know, um, your left is a patient's right and vice versa. And then you try to figure out what are we looking at? So we've got a lot of um, uh, dark space here. That's going to be our lungs. And then right at the very middle, the area with a lot of um, uh, 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 whiteness, that's going to be our heart. And particularly, it's going to be our heart and the great arteries of the heart. So this is an example in my mind of one where um, the answer doesn't immediately stand out at you. I'm looking like, actually, this looks okay until you look a little bit closer and really start to focus in and say, what looks different? Like, where is something not like the others? Anything come to mind here? Does anyone see anything on this image? So far, we've stumped them. Now, there it is. Aortic, aortic arch, okay. Um, yeah, yeah, we've got a big Good aortic part. arch. Um, but then let's also think, what if I describe this patient? I'm gonna describe it real quick. So here we have, um, you know, a uh, uh, older uh, trucker who's been on the road, uh, you know, working double shifts for the last few weeks uh, and just got off of a really long, uh, you know, car ride um, with limited exercise, comes in. He had uh, kind of a, a sudden onset of uh, dyspnea. And now, yeah, now we're starting to build that. So this is one, they could give you that. They could give you that in the vignette. Likely though, they might not give you that whole story. And where is it? We're looking for something that's not like the other. And I'm trying to draw my draw here. Oh. David, would you mind drawing on the screen here? I'm having a hard time on my end. No. What do you want me to draw? Oh, this Oh, thing. no, I got it. Yeah, here we are. That's what I was going for. Sorry, Mike. My... Yeah. Oh, oh, double. Perfect. But yeah, something that looks different than the others. Mm -hmm. No. Um, and so that's going to repeat. So now that we start talking about PE, uh, again, um, we're thinking sudden onset dyspnea. That may be or may not be in the event. Um, yeah, we just had a great um, kind of observation that the darkness of the lung fields confused them. And this is really where you're trying to look for that contrast. You're looking for what's white, what's dark, where's mm -hmm. air, where there's no air. And where there is no air, where are there subtleties? And for example, that's where we see that hypodense region uh, right in our uh, pulmonary vasculature here. And if you're having trouble sort of orienting yourself too, I mean, it, it's sort of hard. There's a bunch of like things in the middle. You can see the vertebrae, you can see the ribs, you can see the sternum in the front. So like you can sort of orient yourself that you're in the chest part of it. Um, and then for me, when I, when I look at something like this, you know, think, of, think about anatomic relationships that are constant, like that, that descending aorta right there, always there. So find something that you know to be constant as your anchor and then build out your anatomy from there. And that will help you when they give you an odd slice like this. Because if you know that that's that dot next to the vertebrae is your descending aorta, because it's always the dot next to the vertebrae, you could surmise that the dot on the other side is probably the ascending aorta. Okay, we're well right about here, Rish. What else lives here? And that'll help sort of narrow down what you're trying to see. One other thing, just to hit this home again for everyone out there, where is it located? Right in the middle of the picture. Mm -hmm. no. awesome. Beautiful. Uh, a couple of things just to note. Again, um, we have all, you know, we've got the sudden onset dyspnea, we're gonna have pleuritic chest pain, you're gonna have hyperventilation, of course, but we're also gonna have tachycardia. We see that's highlighted here, we see it's emphasized. And you know, that's kind of a, a, a hallmark finding of, of uh, pulmonary embolism and some other conditions. Um, and so it's just important to know that basically our heart is working really, really hard. It's wanting to get blood, you know, kind of moving through our pulmonary vasculature and it can't. So it's just keep working faster and faster and harder and harder to do so. And so that's just a great, you know, kind of cue in for a PE in this context. The other thing that, that uh, you know, is on this slide here is this emphasis. This is a little bit... Um, you know, for step one, this is not something that you have to know, but we included it because it's something that 
can be fun to know if you know it and you happen to see it on the exam. And that's that when you look at the EKG of someone with a PE, you're going to get what's called an S1, Q3, T3 abnormality. And all that means, if we go to the next uh, slide, is that our right heart is working really, really hard. That makes sense. Where's our blockage? It's after the right heart. It's in the pulmonary circulation. So our right heart is working hard. And again, this is not something you need to know for step one, but it's useful if you do know it which is you're going to get in our lead one, we're going to get S waves. And um, we're going to get a Q wave down here in our lead three. And then the inverted, this is probably the hallmark finding, at least for me, is I always queue into those inverted T waves. And again, if we think of all those things together in the context of the EKG, that means our right heart is working hard. If we think of that in the context of a PE, that makes sense when we've got a big saddle type, you know, embolus sitting right in the middle of our CT scan. And to sort of speak to Elizabeth's question, um, can this cause pulseless electrical activity? Indirectly, it can. Um, so, I mean, you think about a, a saddle PE, it, you're basically causing an acute um, right heart afterload uh, increase. And your right heart doesn't operate at very um, high pressure. Shout out to the uh, webinar we're doing next week about heart failure. Pathophase, uh, but it only operates at a pressure of about 25 over eight. So a big PE is going to put a lot of extra pressure on the right side of the heart that it can't pump to. And if you can't get it to the left side of the heart, you can't get blood out to the rest of the body. Then your myocardium becomes irritable and you can, you can throw an arrhythmia and that arrhythmia can lead to loss of contractility that can lead to pulseless electrical activity. So it can, there's not a discrete association that you can't connect the two really like one to one. It takes like four or five steps. But what you've probably heard is that for somebody in pulseless electrical activity, if they're young, check for PE because it's a reversible cause of PE. So Elizabeth, that makes sense. I had, I had a case um, when I was an intern of a, of a young woman who, um, what's it called, um, had just had a ortho surgery, super high risk factor for BE, and like wasn't moving around with or ortho surgery and threw a massive PE and coded, um, and unfortunately did not make it. Um, and to Sarvani, um, S1, Q3, T3 is a board favorite. It is a board favorite. It's, if, if there's an S1, Q3, T3, there's a PE. In real life, it is an awful, if it's, if it's an awful finding. The sensitivity is like 40% and the specificity is like 40%, um, not literally, but it's, it's, true. it's not helpful in real life. But on the boards, if you see S1, Q3, T3, take it to the bank. One of my attendings jokes that if in real life that there's an S1, Q3, T3, that means there's no PE because of how, <laughs> how, how poor it really is when it was tested. So, um, oh boy, this is, this appears to be serious. I agree. So <laughs> what's, uh, yeah, not great. Um, while everyone's answering, more, more, more story time. Um, I had a patient who was actually a, uh, a doctor who, um, what's it called? What, 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 what a genetic, what genetic diseases is this uh, connected to classically? Let's see. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. It was a, both of them, but, but um, what's it called? Um, this this doctor who worked at the the clinic an outpatient clinic um had morphines and had the classical onset tearing pain and he just turned to his staff and he's like oh i've i've dissected uh and he was right so and it was there um and that this is what it looks like uh, if they're going to give you a dissection on step one it's going to need to be big and obvious like this so not all of them are um, but other, other things that I can think of, how do you, uh, yeah, tearing chest pain, radiating to the back, um, is a classical association for it. Um, I was always taught that like, 
if somebody has dissection, they tell you exactly when it started. It's not, I don't know, it was a couple of hours ago. It was like, uh, it was 824. Um, it, um, because it, uh, it just comes on so quickly. Um, so yeah, this is aortic dissection, sudden onset chest pain range in the back. Um, don't give this aspirin. Don't do it. Don't do it. Um, you may make it worse. Um, what's it called? Risk, uh, risk factors, hypertension is the big one. Um, if you have unequal arms, blood pressures, uh, that's the classical finding. Wide and mediastinum. Um, let's, let's give them some biostats. Is a wide and mediastinum sensitive, specific, both or neither? And then San, I'll get to your question. See if we could uh, really challenge from here. Uh, it is correct, Joseph, it is specific. The lack of a widened mediastinum does not mean there's not a dissection, but if you see a widened mediastinum, you better call it, start calling uh, cardiothoracic surgery. Correct, it can also be widened in anthrax, but that'll present differently. Um, so um, what was the question up here? Oh, differentiate between dissection and aneurysm. Dissection is a basically a splitting of the wall that allows for there to be a false lumen. Um, classically, again, tearing onset chest pain radiating to the back. Aneurysm is just the growth of the aorta, um, usually by long term. Usually it's uh, associated with um, elderly male smokers. Um, um, I think smoking is the most, most, is the biggest risk factor of it. That just causes the dilation of the aorta over time. Um, so dissection, a tearing in the wall that creates a false lumen, aneurysm, just a growth over time um, that, um, that eventually can get big enough to burst because of the thinness of the wall um, around it. Um, and then, comparison to the <laughs> Yeah. So guy, a guy or gal on the left is going home. Guy or gal on the right is uh, going to the OR. So there's a uh, large difference here. Um, dissection has a spray-like pattern of contrast. Um, I don't think I, I don't think I've heard it described like that, but it's not entirely. It's not. It's not a wrong way to think about it. It's it's, it's sort of scattered across the uh, uh, the thing. So symptom-wise, just to just to follow up, aneurysms usually don't hurt until they burst. Um, aneurysms, I mean, you have, if it's on the exam, uh, then they're gonna have that pulsatile mass. If you find a pulsatile mass, you should probably start calling people um, because like it's big if you can find it. Um, I've only found a pulsatile mass when I know it's there. Um, but uh, aneurysm, yeah, either they're, it's gonna burst and they're gonna have sudden onset hypotension and belly pain or they're just gonna find it on screening. You're gonna CAT scan them for something else. Like, oh, look at that, it's, it's big. Uh, Mustafa asked, why shouldn't we give them aspirin? Because, if they, because they're bleeding into that false lumen. And if you give them basically an antiplatelet agent like aspirin, you may worsen that bleeding. Um, it, when, if it's tearing, it's tearing in different places too. It might tear to the coronary arteries. It might tear up to the brain and cause a stroke. So it may increase the size of the false lumen and basically increase the morbidity and mortality. Um, That's a great question. Yeah, real, really good top-notch questions, everyone. Well done. Um, speaking of wide and media style, this is uh, sort of what it looks like. Classically, I don't know, Cam, what you were taught. I was taught it's an old, outdated um, way to measure it. But um, to take a pager... And if you're, if the white media slime is larger than the pager, uh, then it's widened. I wasn't taught that, but I'm definitely going to use that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So obviously that's, that can only help you so much on, on step one, but, uh, yeah, it's kind of boot shaped. Um, it's, so this is, this is actually, uh, not Teta flow. This is just a, a, a non-specific wine and media Um, boot shape tends to not be so wide up here at the top. So. If it was a true boot shape, they'd probably be younger. This looks like a, an adult, but like probably up to about here would be boot shaped. 
up here is pure mediastinum. This, this area here is like the aortic knob and anything above that shouldn't be associated with the heart. But that's a very good thought. Boot shape, tetralogy of flow, that is strong uh, associations. And again, this one has a lot of parts to it compared to normal. So this is what I hope your and my x-rays look like. So I hope, um, what's it called? Uh, all right, image nine. Camden, what do we got nine. here? This is a great image for practicing some of the techniques we talked about today. So when you look at this, one of the very first things we talked about on the first image is one of the very first things to look for is symmetry. Are we looking for something asymmetrical or symmetrical? Obviously, color, texture, anything that kind of sticks out on the image also helps. Okay, we're getting some interesting ideas here. Um, mm -hmm. But let's say we're working down, we have this patient, and we work our way down. And let's, again, using our techniques from the image, I like to start in the center and you know, work my way out. I know I'm looking at the neck. I know I've got my clavicles. You know, somewhere around here is what I'm looking at. Okay. And we start to see that if I'm looking for symmetry, there is an asymmetry right here, where on this side, we've got um, a kind of a bulge in that area. So what comes to mind um, when you think about what could be kind of residing in this area? Let's just think about basic anatomy. What is something that would reside, reside kind of right in this superclavicular area? Look at that, the radiologist arrow sign. That's nice. <laughs> Uh, I, didn't, I don't know how to do that. I don't know. <laughs> a lot uh, of time on Zoom. Uh, uh, lymph <laughs> nodes, exactly. Yeah, so this is going to be what's called Virchow's node. I said that incorrectly, Virchow's node. Uh, and, uh, the, you know, the other way to rephrase this, this is going to be our superclavicular, so above the clavicle, lymphadenopathy. And we're getting a lot of good ideas coming through here, but what do you think about when you think about pathology of the lymph nodes that is asymmetrical? You're thinking cancer. We're thinking malignancy. Exactly. And in particular, we're seeing this show up um, from a lot of you in the chat. We're thinking stomach cancer. That's the big time for step one. Kind of any of that GI system. But again, when you think of what is the most likely, stomach. Stomach cancer is going to be the most likely. And again, to tie together with our image techniques, we look for symmetry. We see asymmetry. We think about asymmetric pathologies. Cancer is a great asymmetric pathology because it's not going to usually show up equally on both sides in most systems. And then we use that to help inform our differential. Uh, and yeah, to round it out, of course, the other, you know, the three of the triad is stasis, hypercoagulability, and endothelial damage. It's a couple docs from the 1800s, and they just named everything. So, <laughs> Vercal, Paget, no. Paget's got like five things. Yeah, I know. He, 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 he got three, good. man. He was busy. <laughs> um, all right. Image 10. Oh my God. It's a, there was a, there was a big multi-car pileup and all these patients come to your trauma bay. Oh my goodness. Let's start with the one on the left. Now, now excellent. This is, uh, well, I'll give everyone a couple ones. We're doing we're doing just the one all the way to the left, and we've got never some chance. This is indeed a epidural hematoma. Next one, another good arrow there. Um, epidural hematoma, classically associated with massive trauma to the terion that overlies the middle meningeal artery. The way I remember. Um, is MMA fighters protect the side of their heads because that's where their uh, MMA or middle meningeal artery is. And you don't like to be punched on the side of your head. That was always the mnemonic that helped that's me. That's a great that. mnemonic. That's Thank you. One. Um, and yeah, it's a big one. Uh, it, uh, it obeys suture lines um, and it makes this lenticular shape uh, and it's bad. So the middle one, I see people starting to jump ahead. It is indeed a subarachoid hemorrhage, which is the bursting of a aneurysm. This is sometimes called the star sign um, of subarachoid hemorrhage. How does this present usually in the ED or clinic? What is usually the, the chief complaint? Yeah, yeah, worst 
worst headache of my life. That's a classic thunderclap. Thunderclap is probably the best way to describe it. So if, you ask, if you ask anyone, it's the worst headache of the life. People tend to say yes. Um, so I've learned it's actually thunderclap, which means maximal onset, maximal intensity on onset. Thunderclap is a nice buzzword. Maximal intensity within like a minute or so. Not like, oh man, I've had this headache four days and it's just getting worse every day. That's not a thunderclap style headache. Or like severe pain with exertion or valsalva. Um, classically, they could give you uh, weightlifting, uh, like weightlifting, uh, then all of a sudden a severe headache or lifting something or intercourse. Anything that is sort of strenuous and an acute onset severe headache is highly suggestive of subarachoid uh, hemorrhage. Um, excellent. Um, and what's it called? Where, just for extra points, where do berry aneurysms most like to live? That's a great step one question. Oh, they love that. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, the anterior and also posterior communicating arteries. And where they live will tell you the, if there's an asymptomatic berry aneurysm in the anterior communicating artery, um, you'll see bitemporal hemianopsia. Or you may see bitemporal, it's on the board, you'll see bitemporal hemianopsia. <laughs> um, the posterior communicating artery, you may see an oculomotor palsy. You may see a, um, what's it called, dilated down and out eye with lid lag or something like that. Um, and then to the right, what do we got here all the way to the right? Yes, 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 yes. It is indeed a subdural. I know everyone's answered it for like, like two minutes ago. Um, yep, bridging veins, classically in um, the elderly who have less brain parenchyma, and so there's less infrastructure scaffolding around the bridging veins that connect the scalp to the skull, and so they shear fairly easily. Um, what's it called? When you all get the step two, there's a whole lot of details that I'm just sliding right over here. Um, uh, so yeah, here is epidural hematoma, middle meningeal artery over the terion, yeah, this is classically called do, um, talk and die syndrome. Um, it's usually like a teenager uh, who like gets hit in the side of the head with a baseball or someone who's assaulted with a bat, something like that, um, does not cross suture lines, AKA it, it obeys suture lines. Two ways to say the same thing. These need to get evacuated. These, uh, these don't do quite well. You can see there's midline shift here. There's, there's bad things happening. Um, subarachoid here again is our star sign. Um, beautiful question here. Wish I had thought it. Uh, nemodipine to prevent vasospasms. The whole point is that like your arteries don't love when there's blood on the outside of them. So they think that they shouldn't be there. So they constrict because they think there's active hemorrhage, but that constriction in the brain can precipitate a stroke and that's bad. Um, so yeah, most likely a rupture of a aneurysm or AV malformation. That's also one that could do it. Um, and then subdural. Um, yeah, chronic subdurals are actually quite common. Um, you'll see them uh, often in alcoholic or elderly patients or both um, who just fall a lot. Um, it does cross suture lines because it is below the dura and therefore doesn't have to obey the compartments that the dural sutures um, um, split them into. Bonus, what Ooh. two leads are pathognomonic for non-accidental trauma or sometimes called child abuse? Let's give them a few seconds on this one. Let's yeah. see. Of hint, they don't all, they don't need to be quote unquote uh, epidural subdurals. Yes. <laughs> oh, Tommy. Oh. Everyone say hello to Todd while we wait. So. Yeah, hey, we're seeing some good ones. So we've got one of them. Yeah. Uh, we Subdural. got one of them. And that's, you know, we're talking, it just kind of connected with the last slide subdural so we're thinking midline shift 
uh, um, and the other one is very uh, what's it called? Very difficult. It's very tricky. Retinal hemorrhages. Yes, shaken baby yeah. syndrome. So subdural. The amount of the amount of. Um, oh, thank you, Kitty. Uh, yeah, the amount of uh, what's it called? Uh, force needed to cause a subdural in an infant's brain, or even a retinal hemorrhage, is very high. So it is. Um, you either need, you do either need to have a very severe trauma. Um, the only time I've ever seen a uh, brain bleed in a, in a baby was a, I was on PICU and there was like a 10 month old who fell out of their car seat. Um, and like they had an epidural subdural. But otherwise, it's very hard to get um, uh, the amount of force to cause a bleed in a, in a young child. There's just, you know, their brains are so strong, uh, it's hard to shear those uh, particular veins. Um, well, excellent. It's about to be time for our question and answer. Um, let's do it. So a little bit again, before we get to that, what we do here, again, we go nose to toes, beginning the end of medical education. And so like, not only do you know, we uh, not only do we do these webinars, you know, Camden and I also do tutor real live humans too. So it's not like we're just the people on QVC or Vanna White uh, showing off the, the prizes, we actually do tutor and have been tutoring, I've been tutoring since I was a fourth year and I'm about to be in attending and, to, and that's just you know what we do here. So um, if you have questions or things that you think we could help you from consulting to test taking to, to content, um, by all means reach out and uh, you know, they, uh, they offer you know, all sorts of things. Uh, and it's a free, free phone consult as well. So question, questions, questions. I know you all had so many good questions on there. I hope you saved just a couple for the very end too. Um, uh, by the by, the by, we have our spring study stale, 10% on tutoring with MST. 20% on the fighter of cramming um, uh, in Soviet Russia, you cram fight you. Well, you, ever, you ever hear the old Yakov Smirnoff jokes? Yeah. Uh, and we were, uh, we, well, uh, we were getting some thank yous, but also thank you to all of, all of you yeah, guys for being oh here God, for the feedback. Oh. We really, um, we enjoy the conversation. It makes our lives easy and um, also it helps you learn better from you know these webinars and that's also what's fun to do in tutoring and that's that's why one-on-one -on -one tutoring is so much fun because <laughs> you get that I, back and forth i know I, I think i I'm, i still do it even at, at uh what's it called uh, three four years in it's uh yeah. it's always so much fun um but we'll give people another 30 seconds or so for questions any last thoughts camden's um um what's it called visual diagnosis and how to approach yeah yeah, so I think I just want to rehash just, you know, it's always good. Get back to the basics, figure out where you are, figure out what you're looking at, look for symmetry, look for what you're looking for in the context of the vignette. If they give you something, if they don't give you anything in the vignette, start in the center of the image and look for something weird and use your knowledge of what something looks like when it's normal to know what it looks like when it's abnormal. If you combine all of those things together Images are a great way to get questions right that other people get wrong. And I'm confident that all of you out here, and you guys did a great job today, I'm confident that you guys can really crush these images on step one and beyond. Uh, it's just going to take a little bit of time, a little bit of practice. If you felt like you were out of, your, out of the water a little bit today, that's also fine. Everyone's at different stages. Don't feel you know um, pressured on any of that. It just takes a little bit of time, a little bit of dedication, and you can really get good at visual analysis. Yeah, we all started in the same place y'all are sitting at now. So, um, uh, yeah, there's beautiful thoughts. Again, do it systemically, um, you know, review your images. If it's on, so I always ask, I see the question most often, what images do I need to know? If it's if it's in UWorld, it's, it's, it's fair game, is largely what I just tell people. If it's not on UWorld, meh, don't worry about it too much um, because you, you're just too many things in this world. Um, so yeah, focus on stuff that's, that's on your world. Go through it systemically. Do it several times. You know, work with your friends. Uh, work with, you know, work with us or something like that. And thank you all for coming. 
Um, I think next week, if you all want to come back and hang out, I think I'm doing heart failure and ventilator questions. Yeah. yeah. Is that the, uh, it's a, that, that should be a good one. That'll be, uh, that'll be, that'll be a spicy boy. Uh, well, that, uh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, uh, Camden, thank you so much for, for joining. Right back um, at you. And everyone have a good evening. So, bye now.